Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. Let's jump straight into it. I have a very interesting data sufficiency question for you here that I think we can learn a lot from. So take a minute and, uh, and see what you can make of this. Does any of you think now in hindsight that maybe you went to the statements too soon? Look, I think it's important to start by acknowledging that the portion of the question that's actually a question is really tiny compared to everything else. I mean, everything up to that red line, everything up to that is just free info. That's a lot of information that they're throwing at us for free. We didn't even ask for it. It's not in a statement. It's right there in the question stem. And the question itself is so simple looking. It's just, is x greater than y? This is the kind of data sufficiency question in which we can probably spend almost the entire two minutes just thinking about the free info and just a few seconds evaluating the statements. Evaluating the statements in a question like this should take very little time if you do your job, if you do it correctly. And that's typical for a data sufficiency question in which there's so much free info and then it ends with just, I mean, in this case, it's, it's extreme, right? It's just a word and an inequality, a very simple inequality, followed by a question mark. That's all the question is. Everything before that is free info. So we really have to make a very big deal out of this free info. So what I want you all to ask yourselves as you're reading all of that free info is, what would be the impact of a yes? Meaning, if it turns out that x is greater than y, what would be the significance of that in the context of the free info for that story that they're telling us? What would be the impact if x is greater than y versus on the other side of it, what would be the impact if x is not greater than y? We need to try to figure out why anybody would care to know whether or not x is greater than y. Somebody cares. Why? What's the significance of a yes versus a no here? So Surajit is saying, look, I inferred from the free info that x plus y equals 10. So a yes would mean that x is more than 5 and y is less than 5. And a no would mean the opposite of that. Uh, so that's good, Surajit. It's really good. But there's still a lot of free info that you didn't take advantage of. There's still a lot of information there that you haven't used. Does anybody else want to give it a try? Yeah, and it sounded like, Vivek, maybe you didn't use this part of the free info uh, because you said, oh, the average cost would be somewhere between three and five, but they're talking about specifically 10 kilograms of this material. This material K, which is some kind of mixture of, of A and B, we're talking about 10 kilograms of it. So what I think you should all be asking yourselves, and it sounds like many of you were almost there, is how much could 10 kilograms of material K cost? Like, what's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario? What's the range? What's the logical range for the amount of money that 10 kilograms of K would cost? And I think that that's something that we would naturally do in real life in a situation like this, because we'd want to know, like, I mean, if I don't know what X is and I don't know what Y is, what can I still figure out? Well, I can still figure out the best case and the worst case scenarios. I can still figure out what's the likely or what's the possible range of how much this is going to cost me. If, if these were my dollars, then that's exactly what I'd be thinking. Yeah, that's right. The 10 kilos have to cost somewhere between 30 and 50 because if we we're only using material A, it would be 30. If we we're only using material B, it would be 50. So maybe we should draw a number line that goes from $30 to $50. And we'll say that the left side is if we're only using A and the right side is if we're only using B. 
And the only thing that I think we're still missing on our number line is some kind of uh, overlay of X and Y. Like, what would be the values of X and Y on these two extremes? What would be the values of X and Y in the center? Is X getting bigger as we go from left to right, or is it getting smaller? Same question for Y. These are the questions we should ask ourselves as we're drawing this picture. So why don't I pause here for a minute and let you all catch up. Like, tr try to draw this number line on your paper and see if you can figure out what to do with X and Y on this number line. Good, so we have X equals 10 and Y equals 0 on the left side. In the center, we have x equals y equals 5. And on the right side, we have x is 0 and y is 10. So as we move from left to right, x gets smaller and y gets bigger. And at the center, they're equal. This is 40 bucks right here. Now, do you think that it's possible to get this far, to do all of this work, in under a minute and 45 seconds? including reading the question and thinking about the question and drawing the number line and figuring out where X and Y go. Do you think it's possible to do all of that in under a minute and 45? And I think that spinning the wheels is much more likely to happen if we allow ourselves to get distracted by the statements. And I wonder if that's the big takeaway from this question is to say, look, if there's that much free info in the data sufficiency question stem, do not allow yourself to look at the statements. I mean, I think it's okay to glance at them. They might give you an idea that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, but don't start evaluating them. Do not allow yourself to start, because it's, uh, it's very tempting to start evaluating the statements as soon as possible, because we're under pressure, we only have two minutes per question, we feel like we need to start evaluating the statements as soon as possible, but that's a mistake on a, on a question that has a lot of free info. So. I think that's the takeaway. I think that's takeaway number one. And takeaway number two is to really put yourself in the shoes of someone who would actually care whether X is greater than Y or not, and then ask yourself, well, why do I care? What would be the impact? In, this, in the context of the story that they told me, who cares if X is greater than Y? What would be the impact of that? We need to rephrase the question. Is X greater than Y? How would you rephrase that in the context of your number line? Is total cost under 40? Now we can ask, which statement do you want to start with? Two is literally telling you what you wanted to know, and that's when you know you're on the right track. Like when that happens on the GMAT, you should have a big smile on your face. Like, you got this. This is exactly what would happen if you did a good job. So statement two is sufficient on its own. I'll go ahead and eliminate the answer choices that claim that it isn't. What do we do with statement one? Is there any way to take statement one and overlay that into our picture, into our number line? Can you kind of tell approximately where we would be on the number line in the event that y is exactly four? All we need to know for this question is, would that put you to the left of the center or to the right of the center? And if you can tell by looking at these, if you can tell just by looking at that, that y would be equal to 4 somewhere to the left of the center, something like that. And then ask yourself, where would we go if y is greater than 4? In which direction do we go as y gets bigger? To the right. And the question wanted to know which side of the center are we on, and the answer is I don't know. Because it could be to the left and it could be to the right. It could be on either side of 40. So I'm going to make a claim here that 15 seconds is probably plenty of time to evaluate the statements if you did a good job setting yourself up with a free info. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. Just like we did last week, I'm showing you this question first, and then we're gonna do a similar question that's actually an official GMAT question. Just like we did last week. So, so go ahead and try this. So what's tricky about this question 
is that we have two sources of revenue, two different sources of revenue, and the relationship between them is additive. Right? The, the total revenue would be revenue stream one plus revenue stream two. And then we're supposed to apply these percent changes in the context of an additive relationship. Now, if we think of the percent changes as change factors, one revenue stream gets multiplied by one change factor and the other revenue stream gets multiplied by another change factor. One of the change factors is more than one because it's a percent increase and the other change factor is less than one because it's a percent decrease. But we don't have any information about the revenue streams themselves. And we know we're going to be adding them at the end. It's an additive relationship, as I said. So do we even know which revenue stream is bigger? No. If the revenue streams are identical, and one is increasing by k percent and the other is decreasing by k percent, then the decrease and the increase would cancel out because k percent of the same amount is the same. Let's draw it. So David suggests, yeah. what if they're the same? So imagine that these two things are circles and imagine that they're identical circles. So we have revenues from uh, consumer and we have revenues from uh, machines. Now, if these are two identical circles and the K percent is the same K percent, then in the first circle, we're getting an extra of this area. And in the second circle, we're losing this area. But if that area that we're gaining is the same as the area that we're losing, then overall the sum won't change. If we know which circle is larger, we'd be able to answer the question. That's a really good way to rephrase this question. Which revenue source is larger? That's really what the question is asking. And I'm curious, did this drawing that I drew here with the two circles, did, did that prove useful to any of you? you might benefit from drawing these, this is called a pie chart, right? It's a pie chart, you've got a pie and some percent of that pie is the percent we're talking about. And you could benefit from doing that for a while. Like eventually after you've drawn this kind of thing enough times, you just get it, like it's, it's, it's in your head, you visualize it. Similar to the first question of the day, once you've done a good job rephrasing the question, the statements don't take long. Because we realize that the value of k is irrelevant to this question. And statement one tells us exactly what we wanted to know. So probably 10 to 12 seconds spent on the statements, and you go with a. I might not need to know actual amounts if the question isn't asking for an actual amount. What if these were the same number? Would that change your answer? If what we care about is that distance between the two tick marks, you see how I have that in, in red, I have that highlighted there, the distance between two tick marks. You have to ask yourself, let me ask you this related question, although it might not seem related. If you have a set of numbers and you know that the standard deviation is seven, and then I proceed to multiply each of the numbers in the set by five, can you tell me the new standard deviation? It would be 35. What happens to the standard deviation as a result of a consistent multiplicative change, consistent meaning every single number in the set gets multiplied by the same change factor, that same change factor will be applied to the standard deviation. And what's the reasoning behind that? Well, I think it would be best if you all draw a number line on your paper right now and put on that number line, let's say, negative 2, negative 1, and positive 7. Here's negative 2, here's negative 1, and here's positive 7. Now, if we look at the gaps on this number line, we've got a gap of 1, and we've got a gap of 8. Those are the gaps, 1 and 8. Now what I'd like you to do is triple every number on this number line. And look what happens to your gaps. What happens if we expand the set by a factor of 3? Now that's negative 6, negative 3 and 21. What happens to the gaps? This gap 
is now 3, and this gap is now 24. Gaps have all tripled. If we multiply a set of numbers on the number line by the same change factor, then the gaps among those tick marks will also change by that same change factor. And I've seen the GMAT test that specifically many times. They can test it in the context of standard deviation, like the example I gave you a couple of minutes ago, where they say the, the standard deviation of a set of numbers uh, is 7. What will be the standard deviation of the new set if each number in the set gets multiplied by 5? And the answer is that your standard deviation of 7 also gets multiplied by 5, and it would be 35. I've seen them tested in a question with a conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit. We actually did that question in a, in a previous AMA. And there was also a question that I think we also did in a former AMA. They were talking about the salaries of two people. Both salaries increased by P percent, so by exactly the same percent. And the question wanted to know uh, what happened to the difference between their salaries. So again, the gap between two tech marks on the number line in a multiplicative context. That's why uh, the answer to this question changes if the percent is the same percent. That's the only case in which the answer would be C. If they both changed by exactly the same percent, then we'd be able to say that the difference between them also changed by the same percent. Now, we still wouldn't be able to say how many dollars it changed by, but we would be able to say what percent it changed by if and only if these are the same number. In this case, there are different numbers, and that's why the answer is E. If there's some sum, x plus y, and then I multiply each of them by the same change factor, the sum would be equal to the original sum times that change factor. This is true. Same goes for a difference. That's going to be the same as the gap between them, the difference between them being multiplied by that same change factor. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.